Hi, I'm Stephen Sashin from ZeroShoes.com, and you are? Joshua Horton. From? Planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Put you on the spot that way. Uh, I invited Josh to have a conversation for a number of reasons. One, Josh is an accomplished barefoot runner, but more important, not more importantly, equally importantly, more interestingly perhaps, Josh has a medical condition that is very... Um, instructional, very interesting, very informative when it comes to dealing with barefoot running. And I'm going to have him tell you what that is, then we're going to back up and kind of talk about the whole barefoot thing, and then talk more about your specific situation. Just to let you know, for the sake of full disclosure, we've had this conversation a number of times, um, once over brunch, and once doing a video like this where the sound didn't work. So we're trying again. And I wanted to do this with you for a couple reasons. Um, the one of the biggest is that your particular situation is one that comes up in conversation often mm. a lot of people think they have the same problem some people actually do uh, but either way it's informative about the whole idea of what successful barefoot running looks like and another is that your day job is i do physics yes you do yes you, you say that like that's a question <laughs> that is what you do yes, that is um right. and so josh brings a very good scientific mind to investigating this whole thing about what makes barefoot running work or not work. And his analysis of what he could do or what he had to do to be able to make the transition to barefoot was quite, quite uh, detailed and explicit. And um, how else would you describe it? Those two things. Yeah, those two things are pretty good. Okay, so why don't we start with the punchline first. Tell people what your unique medical condition is. So in a nutshell, I broke this leg and it's an inch longer than the other one. That's a good nutshell. <laughs> so it's not uncommon that I get emails and phone calls from people saying things like, I have, you know, one leg that's longer than the other. And sometimes it's like, you know, it's two millimeters longer. And they'll often say, uh, and my doctor verified it. So they try to add some social proof from some medical professional as if I necessarily care. Um, not that I'm crass about it, but a lot of times I know that this is a fake diagnosis mm -hmm. from someone who's trying to sell you on orthotic or doing, you know, sell you on whatever their treatment plan is. Yep. Uh, and it's often so, such a small amount that it's for all practical purposes meaningless. But, you know, you've got a serious discrepancy. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's pretty visible. And I know, you know, it was one particular bone, so I broke the femur. And I know that it's longer. One, it's pretty obvious to see, but two, they uh, trying to fix it. They sort of, you know, decided to put a rod through my end of my femur and stretch it out because they thought that it was going to be shorter. Sorry, I have the re retraction phenomenon happening when I just think <laughs> of stretching out someone's femur. Yeah, like, oh, you know, over over you know several weeks. So, yeah, it, it's pretty clear what bone it is. So yeah. I have a very like very succinct and you know definable thing. Yeah, it's very yeah. definable. No, it's not like someone's tweaking your heels and saying, "Hey, this one's longer." It's like, no, you look at the length of the, your two femurs. And it's this much different. Yeah. Yeah. So backing up then, were you, prior to getting into barefoot running, were you an athlete? Were you running? Were you... I tried running several times, you know, and I really screwed up myself, um, especially my hip, the right, the hip, <clears throat> excuse me, associated with the longer leg had lots of problems. And, you know, I saw doctors and they gave me a heel lift and everything. And then actually, that actually... A, a heel lift for the other side. For the other side, yeah, okay. just to lift that up. And it gave me... That actually ended up giving me back problems and knee problems on the shorter leg. And just over the years, you know, it was never something I was able to get good at was running. Anything on my feet. So, you know, I'd right. swim because... <laughs> So when, for some reason, when you said anything on my feet, so I'd swim. And I'm thinking, how do you swim on your feet? What the? I'll show you oh, some. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got it. Yeah. So when and what made you think, let's try barefoot when running itself had not worked for you in the past? Yeah, so, you know, I moved to Colorado um, after grad school. And, uh, and so everyone in Colorado runs barefoot, so that explains it all. <laughs> that You know, it was like I got out of the car, and I'm like, oh, no more shoes here, you know? Um, you know, I, uh, I I ended up seeing this guy running by my house pretty frequently with without shoes, and I thought, I mean, I remember driving past him thinking and saying out loud, what an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Only in Boulder, Colorado are people going to run barefoot. Right. He must have a perfect body because right. I know I can't run. And, you know, some time passed, and then I found out about this person, that this person had written a book on barefoot running, and that this person had gotten into a big accident. This person happens to be Michael Sandler. Michael Sandler. Who wrote the book, Barefoot Running. Yes. So you find out that he, here's who he is. I found out here who he's, you know, this is the guy, and, and I read about his story in that, oh, you know, he had, you know, broken his 
leg and hip and had titanium parts and whatnot, and that he had a big leg length discrepancy. And I started to be like, wow, you know, that, that definitely inspired me yeah. for sure that I should start to think about this differently. I often use Michael as an example, not necessarily of, you know, the, the, the way anyone should be running, but as an example of how some dramatic physical um, issues, mm -hmm. I was going to say limitations, but that's not it, is that they're not limitations. Yeah. Is that when you start paying attention, you can find ways to accomplish a whole lot of things that you that many people, doctors included, will tell you you can't do. Right. So, all right, so you bump into Michael, and then what? You know, then I read a book, you know, that <clears throat> another book, it, it's like... A War and Peace? Calvin and Hobbes Trilogy? It's three words. But War and Peace is the only one that I got. Uh, it's like something about being born. Oh yes, uh, born free. Yeah, yeah about the. Um, uh, no, I okay, don't think so, that's it. Yeah, but. this joke is not working. So you read Born to Run. <laughs> yeah, I read Born to Run. <laughs> and you know, long yeah. So you know, that was another inspiration that oh, you know, there's people who don't wear much shoe, if if any shoe at all, and they were able to run. And so yeah, like those. And it just got me thinking. Oh, you know, what's going on here? And you know, from a just. Uh, you know, just, I guess, you know, I think about things scientifically sometimes, it, you know, it just, there were some basics started to fall into place. It's like, oh, I should think about this differently. And so I really started thinking about, you know, what would my legs look like if I was running? So did you do a whole bunch of analysis about how to run before you started running? Or did you just at that some point hit the tipping point where, or go over the edge or reach critical mass, pick the metaphor of your choosing, and then take off your shoes and go for a run? I took off my shoes and I ran outside and... You know, I, you know, obviously I think a little bit about, you know, don't don't heel strike. You know, mm -hmm. that was sort of the big thing everyone, you know, I think three years ago was like, oh, don't heel strike. Right. And, uh, you know, it was pretty immediate that um, I didn't really feel the impacts that I was used to feeling. So I was like, aha, okay, this is a place to start. But then, you know, I, I had to like, the analysis was more like me standing in front of a mirror or thinking about, you know, what do my legs need to look like shape-wise to get my body to be relaxed and more symmetrical. Right. And then once you start to think about that, well, is that functional for moving, like mm -hmm. running and walking? And what do I need to practice? You know, I also right. play music and, you know, I'm a drummer and there's a lot of body movement and, you know, you're adapting yourself to a drum set. This is like, an, this is another environment and it's dynamic and everything. It's like, yeah, I could use those principles as well. So what are the first kinds of things that you started noticing and tweaking and changing and what were the effects? The biggest thing was, okay, well, your legs can definitely change lengths. Like I can squat down on the floor and I can stand up. That's a huge difference. And I'm only... Well, let's, let's, let's rephrase that. It's not that your leg is changing length. It's that the... <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not like you're Stretch Armstrong. Hey, yeah, it's I haven't shown you it. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you know, you're, you're, changing, you're changing your height yes. by bending your legs, by extending your leg, by flexing right. your ankle, by et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this is the thing that I often say when someone tells me they have a leg length discrepancy mm -hmm. i'll say well when especially if it's a small one i say well when you're running there is no leg length your mm -hmm. leg is a spring mm -hmm. so you know if you and how long is a spring it's just continually doing this and running is bouncing from one spring to another walking different story mm -hmm. but running is basically bouncing from one leg to the other and sometimes there'll be people who will say you know i've got like a two millimeter leg length discrepancy and i'll say i'll give you a hundred dollars if you can change your height by just two millimeters by bending or flexing anything right and and there's not a way of doing that but suffice it to say so you can change the length of the thing that is moving by bending it or stretching it in different ways yeah, or I lengthening could, it yeah exactly i could change the height of my hips relative to the floor got it and, and i can do that a little bit differently on either side and so uh realizing that you know and then trying to think about well how do i need you know what shape do my legs need to be in order to move and what do i need to do to my body to accomplish that shape while I'm moving was a big thing. And it really comes down to timing, um, you know. A, an appropriate thing for a drummer to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's different kinds of timing involved. One is, you know, the time at which your foot lands under you. Right. And then there's the timing between, well, if this leg is longer, then I'm going to want to bend it sooner than I'm bending maybe this one. Well, that's an interesting thing because I'm just imagining if you think about a – some idealized shape that the leg is in during the different phases of the gait. Mm -hmm. If you were doing the same thing with both legs, because this one's longer, it would end up just slamming into the ground in advance of what you wanted to do exactly. and not prepared to hit the ground in that way. Exactly. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And so once I realized, you know, what the, you know, what needed to time differently and that this knee needed to bend 
a little bit before this one, mm -hmm. a little bit feels like a lot to your body if you're not used to doing it. And if you're not used to doing it for like 20 plus years like I was, I broke this leg when I was very small. Well, I'm going to say it slightly differently. It's not that you're not used to doing it. It's that you're so used to doing something mm -hmm. Another way to that put it. doing it differently feels really weird, mm -hmm. especially, um, well, I mean, anything really. And, you know, this is interesting, something that I talk with people, when sometimes people will try to make changes to their gait to run barefoot and they say, oh, it's really frustrating. And I say, no, 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 no. Frustration, or what we call frustration, mm -hmm. is the, let's call it the emotional experience of your nervous system trying to learn something new. It's not that it's inherently frustrating, it's that laying down new neural pathways mm -hmm. is an energy intensive process, mm -hmm. and we can experience it as being kind of like, uh, like this for a little bit, because it really is like that in your brain. Yeah, and, and with your legs, I think it might be more so than other things. You know, like learning how to write left-handed, if you mess up, there's not much at stake. <laughs> if you do something stupid with your legs, you could fall. <laughs> yeah. And what I notice is it can be incredibly difficult to get to let your body have the confidence that if it changes something, it's not going to fall or do something like that. And so you have to overcome that resistance of your body to not change. That's a really interesting... That's a big thing. No, I think it's a very big thing. Yeah. Because... Everything we do is supported by this thing we've gotten very comfortable and very familiar with. Yes. And the idea of doing it differently, I mean, it, I can imagine how it really, A, I can imagine how it really could bring up almost this life and death feeling. Mm -hmm. And B, it's, you, when you say that, it makes me think of people that I've worked with where I see something like, you know, they're still reaching out with their feet and I try to get them to do something different. Yeah. And how hard it is even in really safe environments mm -hmm. for people to do it. I'm actually, you just gave me a really funny flashback. I was a diver as a kid. Mm -hmm. So I was at diving camp when I was 10 years old doing an inward dive. So you're standing on the edge of the board facing the wrong way, water's behind you. Mm -hmm. And I had a habit of jumping back too far. And I'm in a spotting belt over a pit full of foam. Yeah. And there's a guy holding a rope, holding me in the air. He's, I'll give you $10 if you can just jump up, do a front flip and land, you know, like try to hit your head on the board. I won't let you. There's no way you will, but because you're jumping out too far, I want you to do something different, and I'll give you 10 bucks mm -hmm. if you just do this thing that's completely safe that feels terrifying. Yes. I couldn't do it. You can't, it's really, <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, even though like an inch sounds weird, to, to let your hips relax into an equal portion, I, for a long time I was able to, you know, I was bending this leg, but my hips still weren't ev you know, even. Right. Because I was still, sh I was shortening the other one to keep it short. Because that's the pressures I was used to. Right. And then I really had to like re figure that out and look at myself in the mirror and then put it all together. Um, I want to back up real quick because we haven't quite touched on what happens when yeah, you take yeah. your shoes off. Okay. And that's the feedback. So to help with overcoming this, you know, not knowing what your body's going to feel like when you change its shape or how it, you know, its form is, when you take off your shoes, you start getting feedback more instantly. Right. And you kind of break that. Did you try doing the same stuff in and out of shoes? Yeah. And what did you notice? It's It can be, that's, that's a funny question. For some things, not wearing shoes is the best. Mm -hmm. For other things, sometimes the signals from the, the sole of your foot can be, especially if you haven't been barefoot for a while, can be very loud mm -hmm. and distract you from other things, maybe more in your upper body that you need to be concentrating on. Oh, interesting. And so it's, uh, you know, it's like, how loud do you want the music to be? Right. You know, uh, like if you're a musician, your monitor mix depend, you know, is going to change how you play. So you need to dial in all these different senses of feedback. And so uh, barefoot... If you could talk like a physicist and not a musician, that would be really <laughs> So the, the feedback loop, <laughs> um, you, you need to have a good amount of feedback and taking off the few, uh, shoes is, is the way to do that. Um, and not only do you get feedback from having, you know, skin on the ground, but without a heel on the shoe, you know, a lot of these shoes have a, sure. a large heel, that's throwing you off balance. Sure. And one thing I've noticed, and I don't, you know, know, uh, you know I think it'd be easy to do some analysis on, but it's, uh, what I notice is that pressure in your heel seems to you know, transmit directly to your hip, and pressure in the ball of your foot seems to transmit more to about around the quad. What's interesting when you say that, I think about uh, the instructions for strength training for deadlifting and squatting, mm -hmm. which, especially deadlifting, is very posterior chain dependent, bare glutes and hamstrings, mm -hmm. and, and, and the backside of your hips. And the cue is to put the pressure on your heels. And I don't think that's just, I mean, it's partly just biomechanical, mm -hmm. but I think, there, I think there's a relationship to that, because if you're gonna, if you're going to activate your glutes, mm -hmm. 
you do it by trying to drive your heel back. Yep. <clears throat> so it would make sense that there's some strong connection. Or actually, I just thought of this. If you think about it developmentally, I, I have a friend who's a crazy physician who uh, does a, th a treatment called prolotherapy. They in put needles, basically they selectively injure your ligaments and tendons to initiate a healing response. Hmm. So he was treating my shoulder and he did something and I felt it go all the way down my arm. And I said, oh wow, you just hit a nerve. He goes, no, that wasn't a nerve there. Mm -hmm. I went, what? He goes, oh, if you think about it developmentally, there was a point when you were a fetus where your hand was coming here and then it kind of did this. Hmm. And so in a similar vein, at some point, your heel was connected to your hip and then it did this. Mm -hmm. So there may be something about the fascia or some thing where there really is that direct connection. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, I did definitely seems to be a mechanical connection, just the way the joints line up. Sure. And the fact that these are sort of opposing with one link between them. Wait, I'm just imagining, so here's the, here's the hip and here's the way this bends. <laughs> yeah, well, they both close. Yeah. Basically, yeah, you have sort of. The I mean, closure. They're, they're both facing this way. Yeah. You know, the the here's the foot, here's the here's the ankle. Right. So it closes this way. Here's the hip. It closes this way. Yes, exactly. Okay. So you have you have this closure here, this one here, and this one here, and these are sort of complementary. And then I think this is sort of complementary, and yeah. it makes sense just where you generate power. You know, but that, that was a big thing. Is if I couldn't feel the ground, I was hitting this leg and and heel sooner, and it was just destroying this hip. Right. And you know joints want to rotate so you want to i mean i think if you're keeping your joints in a rotation you know state then they're going to be saved you're mm -hmm. not going to be grinding them into you know so each other rotating versus yeah 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 they're not meant to slam into each other i mean right. granted you know they develop pressure and they're getting you know there's some you know pressure around them uh, but, but the, but the, i mean the idea is so if we take if we think about a hip joint like this mm -hmm. it's supposed to do this yeah, not this exactly right. yeah and that, i think everyone gets that so <laughs> you know i asked myself once i was you know more balanced because i didn't have a heel under my heel under my heel uh, you know right. a wedge under my foot um i had the increased feedback right and i also had you know this this foot can change its shape a little bit so i, I was able to get just incredibly more balance mm -hmm. out of things and then this hip that could engage mm. then you know, I had to then reprogram how the muscles, the timing between how the muscles were firing on each side. It's going to feel different at first. And then once you... Ding, 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 yeah, ding, Exactly. Yeah. Once you get it and you feel the correct timing, even though, like, you know, this quad might, because my knee's bent a little bit more, this quad might be doing a little more lifting than this one. Right. Once you get used to that, you build some strength, you build some balance and you have this awareness of what it should feel like, your body, it automatically started going to that point instead of the, the bad form. Right, so you didn't, you didn't, for example, start by um, <coughs> finding a thing to run on that was angled and then slowly going to flatter and flatter? Um, I use that sometimes if oh, I need really? to recalibrate. Yeah, I need, <laughs> no, truly. I'm saying it kind of as a joke. I mean, it's like, you know, find something that's like this or run only this way on the street. Well, you can, but you, you, it still doesn't solve the problem. Your feet are angled funny at that point. Well, it doesn't solve the problem that if you find something where you can run this way, eventually you have to get home. That's right. <laughs> you have to turn around. <laughs> Plus, you don't want to run on the wrong side of the street with cars and whatnot, you know. And you can't always find that, but... I think there's something to be said for, especially, you know, if you're trying to learn what it feels like to have something new, to feel it and then, you know, go away from that and come back to it to get right. perspective on it. And, you know, trails are good for that. Right. You know, finding, you know, uh, camera roads and things like that, you know, running onto the curb and then coming back off just to reset yourself. Because um, especially for someone like myself who had been, you know, in normal shoes, you know, mm -hmm. conventional shoes and everything on flat surfaces, not knowing what they were doing with their body for, you know, 20 plus years, you have to, you have to unlearn things and learn new things. Right. That's a, and that's also, a, it's a very interesting point just about learning mm -hmm. the phenomenon of um, going back to what the way it was, exaggerating what you're doing, mm -hmm. kind of finding the range of possibilities so you can kind of find a new normal. Exactly. And, you know, the tendency is uh, there's there's some bad habits I think people just get into, like running up on the balls of their feet mm -hmm. and things like that. And it's very easy to try to run up on the ball of the foot on the long, on the shorter leg right. to increase its length. But then you're you're locking out. But that's a re that's a really interesting thing that it what did it occur to you naturally or analytically to 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 try to make this one shorter instead of make that one longer by 
staying on the ball of your foot. Well, it was obvious that being on the ball of your foot was straining muscles and tendons and didn't feel right. Right. And this leg just automatically started to bend more than the other one. Got it. And I could keep my feet relaxed. Also, I could generate power from the bigger muscles. Right. If you're up on the ball of your foot, you're probably locking your knee out right. more. And you're not using you know what what these muscles on your quads and your and your glutes and everything can do you know and so, you're just straining your calves and, and just to clarify for some people because i know it, it, this could cause some confusion so the, there's a a there are a lot of people who believe that the key to running barefoot is landing on your forefoot mm -hmm. where what we see when we do the research is that you can land on your forefoot you can land on your midfoot there are a lot of ways that you can land um, that are, there's not a way, right. individual differences. And the other is there are some people who believe you're supposed to stay on your forefoot right. and never let your heel touch. Right. Um, a very interesting thing, if you, if you Google, if you get on YouTube or Google and look for Usain Bolt slow motion. Yeah. So sprinters land on the ball of their feet and stay on the ball of the foot. But what you see, it's like ball of the foot landing and then the heel comes down, sometimes touches the ground and springs back. I mean, the spring phenomenon yeah. is really interesting and in a way, Barefoot running is more like sprinting in that regard. Mm -hmm. Even if you land almost flat-footed, it's still in a way more like sprinting because you're trying to get that spring phenomenon, yeah. not the rolling phenomenon. Yeah, you really, I mean, and, I mean, you just, it's a bunch of little levers, you know, and yeah. you kind of want to get them all to you know, act, actuate and, and get rotation around your joints. And if you're up on the ball of your foot, you just, you'll feel it right away. I mean, you're just straining, especially really, I mean, these are smaller muscles. Mm -hmm. It's smaller, you know, parts. Sure. And it just doesn't make sense that this should be... Well, granted, the Achilles know. tendon is a very strong tendon. Is, yes. But that said, when people say, hey, I got into barefoot running and my calves got sore, or my whatever got sore, I need to get stronger, right. my response is usually, no, you need to stop working so hard. Mm -hmm. You need to stop either trying... You need to either stop reaching out with your foot to land on your forefoot, mm -hmm. or you need to stop trying to think that you have to stay on your toes, yep. or you have to stop pushing off the ground with your toes instead of lifting... So, you know, it's like find the places that take less effort is my usual thing. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the Achilles tendon can store energy, but if you keep it short because you're up on the, your toes, it really there's doesn't... No there's no spring. Yeah, you're losing, you're just shorting out that spring. Right. So keeping this relaxed, you know, you putting your knee down really relaxed and using the bigger muscles to drive and keeping the right shape because it's all about shape. I mean, I can jump out of a moving car if I'm trained and land just fine. Right. And not hurt myself. I can also jump out of a car as moving and kill myself, you know. So you want you want to. If you're you know, going to try both of those, you have to do the first one <laughs> first, because right. then you couldn't prove your theory. Yeah, you have to make sure yeah. you're doing those in the right order. You need to know which. But order. the point is that your body has the ability to store the energy that you're sharing with the ground. Right. And if you have the right form and everything, that that storage is going to be efficient, and you're going to be able to move with it, and you're not okay. going to hurt yourself. So let's talk more about that then. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you realize is you needed to bend your knee more through the gait cycle yes. to basically make the longer leg a similar length to the shorter leg, mm -hmm. and that that has a weird feeling at first. Right. And so what else about the shape and application of force into the ground did you start playing with and discovering? I mean, it was really the timing. It was, I think the big thing too was learning what it felt like to get my feet behind me. You, so say more about that. Do you mean the, where you're landing or where your gait cycle is or? It felt like the whole gait cycle was more behind me. Okay. Um, the foot also felt like it was sort of landing very far behind me. It really wasn't. Again, that's just the perceptual thing. We're used to this and trying to move it, it'll feel exaggerated. Exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah. And I also realized, you know, because one side was longer, I was sort of lurching forward with maybe one side. And I was so used to thinking, you know, in front of me because right. my body is trying to not fall. Right. That it wasn't until, you know, I started running on very steep, I mean, very, very steep mountains around here. Up or down or both? Both. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I learned I love, absolutely love downhill. Just can't, I absolutely love it, which I think is strange because I know hiking downhill traditionally was always hard on my knees but then I, I realized how to fold my legs and relax into them and keep them very compressed Interesting. and things were I was just you could just roll down the hill and I, I learned that with Ken Bob actually when he was out here we were running up in the mountains and I saw him and it just oh when he, clicked. when he sees it downhill it's like <laughs> I was like oh this guy's just pulling you know <laughs> couldn't keep up with him and then yeah. I sort of like it's like, what the hell is he doing, you know? And I kept putting the brakes on. You know, I, right. I thought, no, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. Yes, I was. And it wasn't until I, I ran on something so steep that I couldn't put any brake on because if I did, I would just stop. Mm -hmm. That all of a sudden my legs went behind me and I didn't fall. And it was like, oh, 
you know, it's like the little kid on The Incredibles. He realizes he can yeah, run yeah. on water. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like this is working great. Okay, so this back to this whole feeling of getting your legs behind you, and actually bring up Ken Bob reminds me one of his cues is sort of like let your torso lead and your legs try to catch up with you. Mm -hmm. So talk about what it means to have your legs feeling like your feet are behind you, yeah. both from contact through the gait cycle. I mean, it feels very much like, and, and it might sound weird, but I seem to focus actually on where my heel is because I know for me, the heel is what was always getting in the way by landing too soon. So I would, I, I, I anymore concentrate on keeping the heel away from the ground. So wait, hold on. Uh, so if you, so if you don't, if you don't bend everything, mm -hmm. just because it's longer, almost inevitably the heel's gonna hit. Yes. And so if you shorten everything by bending the knee a little more, bending the hip a little more, bringing the toe up a little bit, mm -hmm. that gets it landing further underneath you. Exactly. Okay, got and it. And so I just, I have, I know myself, I have to concentrate on that, now, and that seems to help. Got it, now this is one of the reasons that I wanted to have this conversation, is that's true for everybody. Yes. Is that you need to do that thing of bending the hip, bending the knee, dorsiflecting the foot, getting the toes up a little bit, mm -hmm. so that, so that, and that's a cue for sprinters. They say, you know, you're supposed to dorsiflex your foot, and it, it's just a cue. When you look at sprinters, they don't do that, but mm -hmm. the cue is when you're trying to run faster, your brain wants to reach out, mm -hmm. but the technique for running faster is to get your foot underneath you more, yes. behind you, so you have the spring action happening. Exactly. So it's just a cue to not have your heel hit too soon. Exactly. Or to not have your foot hit too soon. Right. So you discovered that same thing. It's like, so bend the knee, bend the hip a little more to get the length, and bring the toe up to make sure it gets underneath you. Yes. And also, I think you, you even said it, you know, when you're talking about squatting and lifting, you know, it's almost like you're kind of kicking behind you, mm -hmm. you know, ki kicking your heel behind you. You also for, wanna, for landing. Yeah. Because you don't want to actually, because <clears throat> that's one of those things that, that some people see runners and they think that's what you're supposed to do is kick your heels up in the back. Right. Yeah, okay. Just want to, I wanted to clarify for anyone who's watching. That's not what we're talking no, about. No, 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 yeah. no, we're not. It's just, it's just the action. We're still in the landing part. We're still in the landing part. And, you know, and it, it's a gentle landing. It's not like I'm concentrating on like slamming my foot in the ground or kicking right. my heel very hard in the ground. But there's, there's this, you know, when things are feeling like they're in the right shape, my legs in the right shape, and the the heel is landing, and the and meaning the foot is also landing in the right spot, so my forefoot and most of my foot is landing directly under me, the heel slightly behind me, mm -hmm. then the quads and all this big stuff can catch me, mm -hmm. and it can drive, and it can guide the hips level and moving them forward, and um, it took a while for me to feel what that felt like to get it to see right. like oh that's the right feeling right that's not you know i kept for a long time doing things that felt right that weren't right because mm -hmm. they really weren't any different from what i was doing so when you change it it's going to feel weird so you want to so, look for that well so i want to highlight something else because one of the things <clears throat> that you're bringing to this what you're demonstrating is this real um, self-experimental quality of like let's just see what happens if i whatever right not let's do it the way I think that's supposed to be the right way because I read it, heard it, or fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. um, but like, let's find the thing. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate about what you've done because a lot of people, they say, well, you know, show me a video. How am I supposed to do it? Right. And I go, well, it, I, I don't know how you're supposed to do it. Yeah. Here's how this guy's doing it. Here's how this guy's doing it. Mm -hmm. And here's some principles. But if you show someone a video, <clears throat> their natural tendency is to try to imitate that, right. which you can't do unless you're comparing your video to that video. Yeah. Because the way you think it feels yes. is different than the way it's actually happening yeah. very often. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole problem with trying to rely on um, some external thing as the teaching tool rather than experimenting and finding what mm -hmm. makes sense. And the way things look and the way things feel are, are typically very different. Um, I, I like to say, to, as an example, I remember when I, was, uh, when I was in seventh grade, I started doing gymnastics, and part of the compulsory routine was a move where you just had to basically take a couple of steps, <coughs> excuse me, with your arms horizontal. Mm -hmm. So the coach says, put your arms out horizontal, and everyone has their arms like three inches too high because it <laughs> looks horizontal, right. but horizontal is actually, you know, here, wait, I'll do it in the camera. It's like, this looks horizontal to your eye, yeah. but that's horizontal. Right. And learning to do that instead of this mm -hmm. was crazy. And actually, sometimes the smaller changes are the harder ones to get because they're not necessarily, you know, sitting versus standing. That makes, I mean, you can see the yeah. difference. Yeah. But changing little things which have a big effect on your balance and just overall movement can be the hardest to dial in because right. your, your perception of them, you don't 
you might not have a good perception of those things just like you said you might be you know the cues you're just not used to internalizing those things and so i think the whole barefoot running you know minimalist running is it's learning how to move you know correctly but but taking it all in you know mm-hmm. you have all this information you need to learn how your body moves and works and you know like in my situation it just seemed like there's a recipe i just need to find the recipe right so i just need to go through you know systematically sometimes and and figure it out I, it just occurred to me that what's unusual for your situation <clears throat> is in a way you had to learn how to do this correctly by getting the long leg to make changes and what happened on the other side? Was it already doing things correctly to begin with, or did it have to go, oh, wait, what's my version of that? Yeah, I realized <laughs> I, it was, no, it was incredible. It was like, okay, I know I need, I need to sort of level out, you know, drop the hip on the right side. Yeah. Which means this leg needs to be a little more articulated. Well, what's this leg doing? Well, it didn't want, it wanted to drop too because <laughs> it didn't know how to handle those new changes. Right. And so it kept doing that. I'd be like, God, this is really annoying. And then I finally, you know, it just with practice. Yeah, I was able to undo things and learn how it felt correct. But yeah, this one would land um, a little funny. Um, you know, the the foot would land a little weird sometimes. Um, you know, the hip on this side is a lot stronger because it's mm-hmm. always been doing more work. Right. Um, and it has it's been in more of a rotation state than this one. This one's getting jammed a lot. Right. It used to get jammed a whole lot. <clears throat> um, and and that works up, you know, to the torso and everything. You know, sure. the side was a lot weaker and things like that. But you know, with practice, it's really, it's evened out and they've relearned how to support my body. Well, and again, here's why one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation is even for someone who doesn't have a leg length discrepancy, mm-hmm. we're not perfectly symmetrical. Or even right. if we're perfectly symmetrical, which we're not, um, mm-hmm. we don't move symmetrically. Right. And so this idea of almost having to train each side of your body, both independently and interdependently, yeah. is true for everybody. It really is, and you know, there. So in physics, there's something called modes. Uh, people might be used to seeing like a string on a guitar. When you pluck it, it vibrates. Right. And if you put your finger on the fretboard and you change where the position is, it changes the sound. Right. Because you're changing the mode of the string, the shape that it vibrates in. Right. Your body, everything has a mode, a vibrational mode. Um, opera singers. Oh, dude, can, you've so been a boulder. <laughs> everything the vibrations is everywhere. <laughs> We, I mean, we've all felt like... We're not saying that. <laughs> no, we're not saying that. Yeah. We're, we're saying, you know, like acoustical <laughs> vibrations in this case. You know, opera singer can break a glass. You feel bass sometimes from cars for whatever reason. Um, it's usually because they have the bass cranked up. That's usually because yeah, yeah. they have the bass cranked up. Yeah. But, you know, uh, it'll transmit in some rooms better than others. Your body has modes too. Sure. And, you know, you have to, you're trying to find the most... You know, it's a complicated, more complicated system than a string, so the modes are more complex. Right. But the idea is that you're trying to find probably a more efficient mode or some mode that's a little more symmetric or something. When you like find that. just the right level of vibration, isn't that called torquing? <laughs> just thinking. Oh. So. <laughs> so. I just heard that last night. All right. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah. Um, so you're adjusting the short leg as well. And so backing up. What you found on your longer leg is you had to bend the hip, bend the knee, dorsal like the foot to get your foot underneath you. Uh-huh. It, for you, the cue was to kind of drive your heel back yeah, because that got it underneath you and it felt like perhaps, mm-hmm. and it is, a little behind you. Mm-hmm. And then your other leg started basically doing the same. Yeah, the other thing. leg, for the most part, was already pretty, it seemed like it was smarter, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was a little more dominant in, in supporting my body and, and moving things. So. I, I still work on it, right? But it's not; it, it doesn't have the same level of pain associated with it as the right leg. Right. I, I mean, I have a lot of pain. You know, I saw lots of doctors. We call um, that we call that motivation to change. Yes, that's right. Yeah. You know, and you know, I used to send my shoes in to a, a place called, you know, actually, I guess I don't know if I can say the name, but Maybe it, it's another place that you can mail your shoes in, and they would cut them. And it's really difficult, especially nowadays. Modern shoes, they're, the soles are really complicated. You can't cut into them. It, it makes it harder to glue and shape it. And it looks funny. Um, and and it's really hard to get that, that right. Um, mm-hmm. And you're also, you know, for me, you're lengthening the lower part of your leg mm-hmm. when actually this the, the femurs are what are different length. And that changes the function. So right. there's no real way around it. Right. Um, and although it seems like it's just an inch, I have friends who've spent thousands, tens of thousands of dollars and months in recovery because they went and they had their legs changed in length, either one shortened or one lengthened. And that's not that's not a very trivial experience. That's yeah. a, that's life changing, and 
your muscles are a lot and your the way your body activates your muscles is a lot more harder to change even if well, they change the length of the bones the whole your your <clears throat> your brain is designed to figure out the pattern yeah. and make it non-conscious so there's a little trigger that does this whole cascade of events mm -hmm. and we're wired to not have access to that after a certain point yeah because if you had to think about it every time you took a step you'd never be able to move right so getting a new pattern into that non-conscious processing mm -hmm. this is not easy yeah and yeah and I, I mean i don't know how well your body can compensate beyond you know one inch two inches you know half an inch i don't know what that range is and i imagine it's probably different for everybody sure everyone's got different slightly different proportions between the femur and the lower leg and whatnot and just you know everyone's a little different um but i can just say for myself having the tools meaning the feedback the neutral posture from having no you know zero drop situation mm -hmm. um having just such much more you know orders of magnitude more awareness mm -hmm. of what my feet are doing relative to my body has made all the difference so let's <clears throat> let's talk more about that then so now we have this idea of what you're doing to get your foot to land in the right place mm -hmm. but it's not obviously a static thing it's moving as it does that yeah so talk about that phenomenon um well or the, and the, mo the more specific thing i'm saying is it is when your foot is, I mean, it's actually kind of cycling, let's say. Right. <clears throat> so you're, what, are you, what did you discover about how your foot is contacting the ground, not just the location, but the speed with which it's doing that that made things work for you? Um, well, um, I see, we had this conversation before, so I know where I'm going with this. Do you want me to cue you? Yeah, go for it. Talk to me about the speed that your foot hits the ground compared to the speed that you are moving across the ground. Okay, yeah, so it seems to me that the... No, wait, I'm going to pause, and, um, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm cueing you specifically for this, because this is one of those things that um, when you and I brought it up, it's like you were the only other person I'd heard talk about it. Okay. And so um, so I instantly liked you because we agreed. And, um, <laughs> but it, but it's a, I think it's a really important thing, because it's, there's, it's it's, there's a cue that I give about doing this, Okay. Um, which is try to pretend that you're running on a treadmill when you're outside. Yeah. So you have to catch the ground at the speed that it's moving underneath yes. you. Yes, yes. Uh, and I've talked, and I've argued with people about treadmills where they say, oh, running on a treadmill is the same as outside. And it's yeah. like, no. No, it's not. Because all you have to do is catch it. That's right. So talk about the catching phenomenon or the moving phenomenon. And if you want, you can throw in some physics terms. <laughs> no music terms in this I, one. No, no music allowed. So not allowed on this one. You know, I, I, the, the, the legs... Um, I mean, yeah, it's really, you know, you, you're you contacting the ground only in as much time as you need the ground. You're trying, you know, it seems like you're almost avoiding the ground until you need it, you know. Oh, that's a good cue for displacement as well. Yeah. It's like, if you try to think, that's a really good cue, actually. It's like, if you think about trying to avoid it till the last possible moment, mm -hmm. that'll help you get your foot behind you yes. also. Yeah. That's a, uh, that's a good one. Yeah. So, um, but I guess... I, but that's, I mean, it's yeah. like if you do it at the last possible, but, but you can still, you can still get your foot almost behind you. Mm -hmm. And still, if you think about landing rather than moving, rather than catching it mm -hmm. at the same speed you're moving, then you could still end up having more horizontal force, more friction, yeah. more braking forces, even with your foot almost behind you. Yeah. If you try to keep it on the ground too long. Yeah. You want to lift the foot. You know, I mean, you know, concentrating on, on, I guess, lifting the foot off mm -hmm. the ground instead of, you know. So, I mean, I'm giving you the, I'm, I'm telling you this more than you, even though you're the one who explained it better to me originally. I, I guess. <laughs> have no memory of this. But just, just this, I mean, the simple version is this idea of having your foot, when it contacts the ground, being, m moving this way, towards yeah. the front of your body, at the speed that you're moving this way. That's right, yeah. Because otherwise, it's going to be breaking force. Yeah, you have it's to gonna move It's going to be that, extra horizontal. Yeah, exactly. Your foot needs to be moving, you know, away from you at almost, yeah, at the same speed that you're moving the other way right away from yeah. me backwards away from me back yeah. and i know you're right yeah so sorry uh, <clears throat> now do you know what we're talking about yeah yeah no i know what you're talking okay, about <laughs> and take two <laughs> sorry um, no it was like obvious i'm like okay yeah and that's actually a good point is also the turnover of your feet so the speed at which your feet are moving behind you mm -hmm. is matching the speed at which you're moving forward and i think if you really listen to that you're not going to overstride or whatever you're going to realize that if i'm moving slow I'm going to be making smaller circles with my feet. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be contacting the ground and be moving, you know, and moving at the, at the right rate. If I'm really moving faster, 
it might feel like you know they're farther behind me you know but you're still matching the speed of the ground and if you listen to that you know then you're not going to be like trying to take these huge steps even though you're going slow mm -hmm. you know and and over striding and doing all these other things so i think really li really listening okay you know i'm moving at a certain speed forward how fast should my feet be going and am i wasting energy by trying to exaggerate too big of a movement behind me and oh, things like that yeah yeah know? interesting the um uh, and and this uh, and I imagine this relates to the way you experience running, especially downhill. Also, mm -hmm. um, uphill. It's interesting. Sometimes people say, like wearing a pair of warajes, they'll say, "Hey, they make slapping noise," and they go, "Well, they just sit there. You're doing slapping things with them." Mm -hmm. And and I say that's this is good because if you use that sound as a bit of feedback, you'll find that you can change the sound. You can make it louder. You can make it softer. Right. You can make it almost invisible. You can make it, you know, whatever we want. I remember a guy who commented that he noticed when he was running uphill, it was quiet, Yeah. but not when he was running on a flat. So he said, as I started cresting the hill, I just tried to pay attention to what my feet were doing to keep doing the same thing, and then the next thing I know is running quietly. Yeah, that's right. And yep. I think that's true whether you're barefoot or in... Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So the, let's talk about the last part of the gait cycle and how it, affect, how it relates to you as well, but just that feeling of your feet being behind you without doing something like just kicking your heels up right. or whatever. So what did you notice from that for you? I mean, you know, for me, it felt, you know, like all of a sudden the, yeah, the speed that the feet were moving behind me definitely matched the speed at which I was moving forward. And um, that it was really just, once that moment was over, I was just lifting my foot off the ground. I wasn't trying to like kick in the air or mm -hmm. over exaggerate things. And that really it was this very subtle balance between you know, supporting your body and also letting it fall, mm -hmm. you know, and then getting your feet out of the way. Right. And when you get that, like, perfectly, then it was just everything just was really, you know, resonating well. Yeah, I like that. I, wait, uh, um, getting your feet off the ground, um, how'd you say it again? It was like three things, and when you said it, it just struck me. It just had this really elegant feeling to it of... So you still have to support your body, but yeah. you have to fall at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So getting your feet off the ground, having your feet on and off the ground in just enough time to support yourself without having letting you fall while letting you fall just enough just enough that's real i really like that one yeah and <laughs> you know sometimes i picture like someone running on a log or something like mm -hmm. that i mean I, don't, I think that might be a little bit more forceful but running on a log like that thing's just getting away from you all the time and you're always in this constant like perpetual state of perfect balance but not quite yeah yeah you know or something like uh, that. the image that i get is fred flintstone about to take off yeah. actually. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> You know, but or the Roadrunner actually, oh, yeah, it's the, the Roadrunner road where the feet is like zzz, behind him, and then, bing. yeah, and I think that's the actual sound. Bing. Bing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and then cues like the wear on your feet. You know, if you're running on trails, you know, for the longest time, I would, I would always like for whatever reason feel like I was nailing a rock like under my big toe on my right foot. Interesting. And I was, I was still landing out in front of myself. I was catching it and rolling it under my foot. Right. I wasn't landing directly down. You know, I wasn't just coming down and lifting up. And boy, that was, it was scary when I first realized how to do it because I couldn't see my feet. <laughs> and they were, be, they were like under me and behind me. Right. You know, and I had to just give in to the fact that I was going to move forward and then oh, I wasn't going to fall. Right. You know, and then I could really, you know, things just really started falling into place at that point. You know, when your foot, if you're at that point where your foot is kind of behind you or directly underneath you, especially in my case, I can keep that the bend in the leg stays the proper bend because mm -hmm. my heel isn't getting in the way. I'm not in this interference zone where if I do try to extend my leg, I'm actually cocking my hip up. I'm right. moving forward. I'm not pushing my hip up. So if I understand correctly, you're recommending that people break their femur and have it recreated <laughs> badly so that they can learn how to do this correctly. Is that, right? <laughs> is that the whole point of this one? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> or if we could sell that as a kit of some way that we make your leg long temporarily as a training aid, I think, I think we've got something there. Well, you know, running on really, you know. That's a good point. Running on trails that are super steep, I do that because I actually noticed, and this was sort of weird to me at first, that if I was on something really steep where the right, the longer leg was on a much shorter, you know, side. Yeah, yeah. If it was much more than what it was even used to, it was doing better. There was sort of the spot where I had really just bad form because it was trained bad for so long on flat surfaces. You know, what? I'll tell you what's also interesting, what you made me think of. There's some people that I know who train sprinters mm -hmm. by um, putting like a one inch piece of wood or something on the track and you're supposed to only hit it with one leg. Oh, and yeah. part of the idea is for that as well. It's just to get your foot underneath you because otherwise you hit this thing and you just like slam on the brakes. Yeah, that I'd never thought of that. That's so 
making making your leg artificially long or short yes can, is a that's a really clever idea I think it teaches you good form I do it on the other side too because if if it's you know if you're out of your comfort zone I mean you still realize how do I generate you know balance and power and motion with a different you know an environment a different shape under my body you know and you can do it I mean the the it feels like when it gets really you know at a real sharp slant yeah the shorter side might feel like it's turning over a lot quicker. Yeah, it kind of is. It's kind of like doing a lot more work to well, it out. It's yes. I mean, it's it's probably going at the same speed. Yes, it is going. But at the it same has speed. to. But to do that when it's shorter. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. The articulation is a lot more exaggerated. Right. And so you're going to feel like you're doing things quicker because you're changing the lengths of the everything arm. quicker. Yeah. 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 You know, even though the foot is still doing the, the same speed. Right. You know, my knee is is bent more. Right. You're changing things a little differently. So That's yeah, a, it's a good it's a good tool. You know, maybe. I like that one. Yeah. So if you had to if you had to give people, if you were talking on the phone to someone and you said, hey, I've gotten into this barefoot running thing, and they said, wow, that sounds interesting. How do I do it? And you couldn't refer them to a book or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're the guy in charge. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you would say as your Reader's Digest version of what to do next. Um, I would teach them how to stand on one leg and move their body out as far as possible with it bent okay. until their foot is as far as behind them as they can okay. and not fall. Wait, wait, okay, practice. hold it. All right, so you're standing on one leg, mm -hmm. the leg's a little bent. Yeah. Try to move yourself forward. Yep. While staying balanced without falling, not without putting the other leg down. The other leg, actually, so let me, let me back up a little bit. So, right. you know, both legs, uh, it's like, so you start out standing. Okay. A little bend in both knees. Okay. Okay. And then you, if, if let's say you have a long leg that's noticeably longer on, let's say, the longer leg. Let's pretend it's, you know, a, a normal person. Oh, normal person. Okay. okay. So we've got our legs a little bent. Mm -hmm. What do I do next? Uh, keeping the legs bent. Both on the both feet on the ground. Both feet on the ground. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I would, boy. I mean, there's there's a lot. I guess there's a lot of different things to go to. I was well, thinking more of someone with with a discrepancy, but you're saying so. Well, because I don't think it's, I don't think it matters. You're I think right. It's the yeah, same it doesn't thing. matter. So uh, all right, so we got both feet on the ground. We're lifting one leg. Let me, let me back up. Okay, okay. So so okay. What I what I would suggest people do is first of all learn how to um, jump with different kinds of bends in their legs and land softly. Okay, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna put a twist on that one because mm -hmm. the thing I like to say is running isn't really jumping from leg to leg. Yeah, it's lifting one leg off the ground. Yeah. and catching yourself on the other one softly. Yeah, this is not gonna necessarily help with that, but this is gonna teach people what it feels like I think to land and have your legs load elastically. Okay, and not hit your heels in the ground, okay. and that you can not you know protect your, you know people's tendency is to sort of lock out their knees right but to keep your legs not locked out at all and right. to land into them and that they can sink and that they can they can absorb a lot more shock than what you're probably used to right I think that's key okay um, that's actually an old um, uh, plyometrics um, that's the whole principle behind plyometrics is that you can absorb a lot more energy and in mm -hmm. fact the idea is to absorb the energy load the spring and yep. let it propel you more yeah and and their stories I'm sure they're apocryphal um, of Russian sprinters where they wouldn't let these guys sprint until they could step off a 20-foot ladder yeah, I've heard about and land. <laughs> I don't yeah. buy it. But nonetheless, I yeah. mean, you can really absorb a lot more than you think. A lot more than you think. Yeah. And, you know, learn how to jump off steps softly and elastically so you're not just, you know, grinding your bones around. You want all your joints to, to rotate and your muscles to absorb to, that to, to move. Yeah, to move and okay. act like a spring. And I think that's going to give you the confidence to get your feet behind you because you're gonna have to land you know eventually your way when your foot comes in contact with the ground and your legs are acting elastically mm -hmm. then you're gonna have to have that confidence that your body is gonna support yourself you're not gonna fall over and that you can you know navigate these situations but this other thing you're saying that of the idea cause I, I, and this may be where you're going maybe not of mm -hmm. having one foot up and sort of driving your the heel that's on the ground driving your heel back which is going to move your body forward yes and what driving the heel back means that you're engaging the glutes and the hamstrings to move you right keeping your torso upright as you do this mm -hmm. you go pretty far yeah before you feel the reflexive need to put your other foot down yeah and i would practice doing that farther and farther and farther there's going to be a point where yeah your, your foot's going to come down right but you can also you also want to practice having the Just foot that's that's supporting you do the driving and the foot that's maybe off the ground, not trying to reach out for right. you. Just land yeah. right underneath so, you. Yeah, this, uh, this, this is actually how I teach people about walking. Mm -hmm. It's like 
use the heel to drive back, or what I usually say is contract your glutes and your hamstrings, but I realize that some people, when they do that, they do it isometrically, so they just make them tight yeah. <coughs> while they tighten the front of their body, too. Well, so drive your heel back, mm -hmm. which means using your glutes and your hamstrings. Yep. Wait till the last p possible moment till your foot lands, That's right. or to keep you from falling. And when you do, it's typically going to land slightly midfoot-ish, mm -hmm. and usually right underneath your body, because right. it doesn't have to do anything else, mm -hmm. and then repeat. Yep. And it ends up being really smooth, yeah. and you feel very um, like you could balance something on your head. Yeah. You know, it it has a it's a very different feeling. Some and and especially if you haven't really used your glutes before, you can feel kind of it's not it's, it, it it's took, strong. Yeah, it's really strong, and I think it's key because I I you know I've gone out and taken people running you know barefoot and in minimalist shoes or whatnot, and you know it's about act you know I talked about you know activating your having your glutes activate and you're right some people will just squeeze their butt right and you're like no no you have to engage it and, <laughs> right. and that means you have to have the right form in your legs for it. it'll naturally engage when things are set up right yeah you're not you're not just sitting there like tensing your butt the whole time right you know and so it's i think it's it's learning okay what am i doing with the shape of my legs so that when i'm doing it that i get this activation mm -hmm. and then once that all lines up you're probably doing things pretty right mm -hmm. i mean that's what it seems like to me um and doing this little exercise where you, you know you lift one leg off the ground and you start to drive forward with that other leg, feel it support you, feel it bend, feel it move, you feel those muscles actuate, not overstretch that the right. leg you're on can actually support you for a long time for a long time, and and alternate legs and you know and then do that. And I, I think those are just learning how to get your legs supporting you and get that foot behind you is like really important. I like it. Yeah, it's really important. That's a good one. And you know, honestly, there's other sports that this works for. Surfing. I mean you see surfer, their legs are bent, you know? Interesting. Their their feet are behind them. They're really relaxed, you know? Um, the Indo board is like a, a, a tool people use for training for surfing. Look at that the 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 directions on that, I think the posture is it's very similar to running because you're you're supporting yourself on something that's moving. You need all the balance and coordination of those legs to, to keep your body, you know, balanced. Um, it's another really good tool. So, lesson number one, get your femur broken and then take up surfing. That's right. <laughs> and then you got it. Yeah, or, you know, paddle boarding too. Interesting. That kind of stuff. Yeah, I got into that because I was like, oh, it's, it's just completely throwing me off balance, but... I need that. I haven't paddleboarded yet, um, but I imagine there's a similar component with having to activate the glutes to get the drive behind you. Yeah. Yep. Fascinating. And I think another thing that just is consistent with that is, you know, cross train. You know, you need to be not just running, I think, mm -hmm. as well. You need to be doing other things as well to keep your body aware of itself and, you know, using all these other well, muscles. Well, <coughs> I'll have another reason for cross training uh, or resting either way. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I like to point out is, learning a new skill while you're actually trying to do it mm -hmm. has that frustrating flavor yep. because you're you're doing something unusual your brain's trying to figure it out it's trying to lay down new pathways mm -hmm. the learning happens mm -hmm. in the resting period in between yeah when yep. it consolidates and then you try it again and it's suddenly magically better even though you haven't been practicing in between mm -hmm. because your brain has figured it out or it's done it the best that it can in laying down new neural pathways right. then you try again start again start again mm -hmm. so the learning happens during the resting not the doing although sometimes during the doing you have an aha moment mm -hmm. but what locks that in place is the rest afterwards yeah it really you just solidifies things most definitely cool. yeah um anything else you can think of you know in terms of having a leg length discrepancy you know if you stand in front of the mirror pick a leg it doesn't matter just lift one up and then start to just rotate around the hip I mean, you could make it where it's not even hitting the ground, and then you just start to open up your knee a little bit more, a little bit more until it grazes the ground. That's your spot, okay? And uh, then, that's good. then you realize this is what the hip needs to feel like, and that'll dial in the hip. Then you need to actually start to move to feel what, what the glutes and everything else start to feel like. But the key is, is that we tend to extend our knee too early. I mean, right. people just walk with their legs locked out most of the time, right. anyways, and they don't use their hips and no. their glutes and whatnot. And so, it really the key to that is that. You know, you can change the length by changing your knee, and then you can drive with your hip. I think, I think that's a I think that's a good cue and a good a, again a good drill for anybody. <clears throat> Sadly, you, it's hard to make one leg longer to do that, but you can fake it. I mean, you know, bend your support leg. Yeah, exactly. And just experiment with what the other leg has to do. And you should do that. You should. Yeah, no, I think it. I think that's a really good exercise. Mm -hmm. Now that you say it, that that would be a really good one, just to go. Oh, that's what where it has to hit. Yeah, that's what it's going to feel like when it's when everything is bent and engaged. 
And I would even add one, I'm just playing with this in my mind, it might be interesting to do something where you cycle it a couple of times, and then on like the third one, you use it to just kind of pop a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just like a little jump, a yep. little something. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised that it, it's still hard to keep your, you want to keep your foot relaxed and your calf relaxed. And, still, right. and it can be, your body does not want to let you do that because it's not used to it. Right. You need to break the, the fear or just the, the it not expecting, yeah, the, the, bat, the habit of yeah. it trying to always like protect itself and to lock itself out or, or keep its, you know, keep your leg not as compressed as it, as it could be. Well, actually, let me ask about that. So what does it mean to have your calf and your ankle relaxed when if you really relax them, mm -hmm. your toe's gonna point down, it's gonna plantar flex, mm -hmm. and it would naturally hit the ground in advance. That's right. So what do you so how do you reconcile the relaxing with not doing that? Well you know Or the, doing that in a different way. Yeah, doing that in a different I mean you can you can flex your foot too. Mm -hmm. I mean when you're running, you know, you kinda keep it a little bit flexed or whatever. But I think it just it just teaches you to keep one part of your leg aware, like learn the awareness of those different sections. Got it. You know, by letting the let's say below the knee staying very relaxed while you're driving with this. Or vice versa. You know, you can do things where you're not really doing much with your hips or your glutes and you are, you know, you're you're doing calf raises or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, just there you have this whole chain. Right. Right. You have the big gears and then you have the smaller gears. And uh you know, I'm going to go back to music, but it's very much like drums. You know, you have the shoulder and you have your, your torso and everything, but then you have your fingers. Right. You know, and when you're doing fine work or whatever, you know, you're using that. But if, if this isn't working right and getting your hand in the right spot, you're going to tear yourself up, you know? You know, it's interesting. This is why I say the benefits of being barefoot or having something that lets you really articulate mm -hmm. are above and beyond what people think. In part, one of the I think one of the reasons that so many people – who get into barefoot running have dramatic improvements in or, or lessening in knee pain, hip pain, back pain is because your foot is designed to do mm -hmm. the fine work. Yeah. And if you don't let it because you're in big thick shoes or because you've been in shoes long enough that your foot is basically immobile and your brain doesn't know how to activate it because it hasn't for so long, mm -hmm. um, when you can do this, everything works. When you can't do this, those functions try to move upstream into the ankle, the knee, and the That's hip, right. which are not designed to do that. Right. Same thing with drumming, obviously. If you're yeah. doing too much, if you're not, don't have this, yes. you're going to try and do it here, right. which is going to mess you up. Yeah. And I think just, you know, things that are going to activate those different parts of your leg and get them smarter in reaction time, because, you know, instead of tensing up your calves to support your body, you can keep your calves and your feet really loose and you can still squat all the way down. And you can squat all the way up and you can learn how to use these bigger muscles and the, the way your leg is shaped. So you're drivers. suggesting that the bigger muscles might be bigger for some actual reason? Maybe to like do heavier <laughs> lifting. Yeah, just a little bit. Like yeah. that's not an accident? No, it's, yeah, I know, right? It sounds so like, wow. it doesn't make any sense. Wow, and yeah. you're a physicist, not an evolutionary biologist. No. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Anything else? I, I think that's it. Well, um, thank you very much. As always, it's a pleasure. I hope that you have found this useful and interesting. Um, please add comments, questions, etc., uh, to wherever this happens to be posted. If it's on YouTube, there's comments. If it's on our website, there's comments. If it's on Facebook, there's comments. Um, toss them in. I'm going to point you to all these, so if someone asks something that's about you, you can chime in if you like. Um, and uh, if you need $1,000 an hour coaching clients, <laughs> you know, if you've got that kind of issue and I'm, the insurance. I'm more than happy to, to, to discuss things with people. Sweet. Um, you know, this is anecdotal. You know, I, I even went back and talked to the, my doctor from, you know, the, the early 80s who worked on me when I sort of got into this and I said, this is working. What did he say? He was like, you know, he actually did say that some of the best um, changes come from a lot of anecdotal evidence, you know, because we're able to do the experiment, quote unquote, out right. in the real world. You know, obviously you have to, to, to investigate, you know, what are the parameters that this is happening under, but, you know, there's a lot of, people coming out, you know, and, and things like that. Anecdotal like information is not the same as data, but it is useful yeah. if you know how to break it down and analyze exactly. it. Exactly. Sort of, you gave me a great flashback to, um, uh, I was having dinner with a bunch of Tai Chi guys, and one this one Tai Chi guy had been, these were people who used Tai Chi as an actual fighting art, not just relaxation, etc. And uh, one of them talked about how during a fight he had had his spine broken and used the Wu style of Tai Chi to... Uh, uh, healed his back mm -hmm. and this one other guy says well you know I had my back broken and I used the Yang style in Tai Chi and I healed my back and they're having this big argument about you know why one versus the other and finally this one other guy goes alright alright wait 
let's settle this once and for all. We get 20 guys. We break their backs. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so you know, it was, it was they each had useful anecdotal data. Yeah. But they were misinterpreting it slightly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so but and I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity. You know, pleasure. Um, I, I like I said, I, I know a lot of people. You know, I see people walking, and I notice, you know, oh, that person's got their shoe modified or whatever. And right. You know, I've stopped people in the street and have chit chat because it's really it's one of those things. It's not enough of a thing where I mean, you know, do you want to spend tens of thousands of dollars? and not have a sure outcome, I mean, who knows, you know, how things are going to work. This, at least, there's, it just feels like there's a lot more in your control right. to, to try to change things for yourself, and you have a lot of control over it, you know, and you can test it and see what works. You can, you can become your own coach, which yeah. is the much more valuable thing, way beyond barefoot running, walking, whatever, yes. is learning to become your own experimental, what's the word I'm looking for? You become your own experiment. Yeah. Be your own, your own scientist and... Uh, uh, and uh, uh, experiment. <laughs> and let uh, me, I want to add one more quick thing because uh, just so everyone knows, and I, it seems to be consistent with everyone I've talked to who's had like, you know, a centimeter or more leg length difference. Walking is a lot harder than running. Absolutely. It is just a lot harder. That Things move a lot slower, um, especially you tend to be wearing shoes a lot more often because you're in like a job situation or somewhere, you know, where you just, you're well, not going to be wearing. And you're not doing you, the bouncing from spring to spring thing. Yeah, the, the handoff is a lot more immediate between one side and the other whereas if you're running you know there's a, there's a period potentially in the air you just have right. a lot more time for, to set up right. you know the, the sides and you just don't have that and it's just a little different um you know dynamics you might not be necessarily always loading elastically you know you can roll off your heel and things right. like that so it's a little more differently but the same principles apply you can change the effective length of either side you got to listen to that you got to you know learn how to time you know, the extension of one leg versus the other and, and things like that. Cool. Well, once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Very okay. much looking forward to what you discover, what you experience, what you share. And by the way, if you're someone who has a story, not necessarily like Josh's, but something where you've dealt with a situation uh, and found a way to handle it, overcome it, learn from it, uh, that you'd like to share, drop me a note because I, we can either do it this way or we can get on Skype or Google Hangout or do something. But I'd like to just share more stories from people who have uh, something to say about a barefoot experience who aren't necessarily out there trying to establish themselves as coaches or trainers or whatever. So hopefully we can have more of these conversations and create this great body of information about what it means to make that transition to a happy, effective, enjoyable, fun, barefoot living. So feel the world. Enjoy.